And, and this morning, we're very pleased to welcome to our uh, to Gateway, Sunder uh, Krishnan. And Sunder comes to us uh, just having returned from overseas to speaking. And uh, Sunder uh, came to Canada many years ago, and in, I believe it was 1980, he took on the position of senior pastor at uh, Rexdale Lions Church in Toronto. And he was there for 36 years, in building that church up in a preaching ministry that was powerfully blessed by the Lord and utilized by God to impact so many different lives. Today, he is retired, sort of, but as he travels around the world in different ways of speaking and, and sharing the good news of Jesus Christ. And today, his passions remain what they, I think they have always been, which is teaching the word and continuing to mentor the next generation of leadership in God's church. And so we're so very, very pleased to have Sunder here this morning. And brother, we just, uh, I, I sat through the first service, so I know what a treat you're in for. But would you please welcome Sunder to Gateway this morning? Thank you. Thank you. It's just really an incredible honor for me to be here with my friend Steve on this wonderful occasion. Um, as I was thinking about this message, my mind went, I want to kind of approach it from left field. My, many of you know my brother-in-law, Ravi Zacharias. Ravi recently, about a year ago, he and I, on one of those rare occasions when our paths crossed, he was just telling me about um, an incident that happened when his book publisher invited him for lunch. And over lunch, he asked him this question. He said, uh, which do you think is the most influential decade in a person's life? Ravi said, I kind of guessed maybe the 50s. It sounded like a wise answer. He said, no, actually, that happens to be the third most influential decade in a person's life. The 60s are the most influential. The 70s are the second most influential. And you say, well, that's interesting, but why are you telling that to us? Well, you know, I, I don't know Steve's exact age, but he's my son's contemporary, so I can guess he's probably in his mid-40s. So maybe another four or five years, he'll hit 50. And, you know, he would have been a pastor for 25 years in this church, and he's only just beginning on the most significant years of his life. And then I began to think of you as a church. How, I, don't, I can't name another church that could say, we have had our pastor with us for 25 years, and we're all just about ready to hit our real peak. Isn't that amazing? That potential in you that is locked up in this church is unbelievable. And I want to unlock that potential today. And so this whole message is crafted in the form of a blessing, an extended blessing. Not just one benediction at the end, the whole message is a blessing. Because blessings have power to do two things. They have power to create, but just as important, maybe even more important, they have, to, they have the power to call out and release what is inside people that they themselves may not be aware of or they don't believe is in them. I believe with all of my heart, you are poised. I mean, look at the impact that's already been made. And to think that you ain't seen nothing yet <laughs> is, is mind-boggling. So I want you to believe that. But it's not going to happen just by saying, I believe. It's going to happen through the power of blessing. Now, so I'm going to unpack the blessing that came from a text of Scripture that I will read for you in a minute. So I'm going to pause three or four times during the message to actually bless you. And preaching is kind of shifted at that point to a prophetic word. And you need to just receive that in faith. Because, and at the end, I'll just wrap them all up again a second time. Blessing is incredibly powerful. One of the most influential gifts that God gives through leaders is the power of the tongue, not only to preach, but to bless. And God said to Moses, about Aaron and his priesthood. He said, you tell Aaron that they are to bless my people. He said, but they will just simply say the words. They will put my name on them is the way he put it. His name there is Lord, Yahweh, the covenant-making and covenant-keeping God. He said, they will put my name on it and I will bless them. So it's only God who's going to do the blessing. But I just put those words in the full power of the name of Yahweh, the covenant-keeping God behind them. So when we get to those parts in particular, I would just want you to receive that blessing by faith. My text, as I was praying about this a couple of weeks ago, uh, I happened to spend the last five weeks in the Far East. 
So I didn't have this winter to deal with. I was out walking and praying every day, which I love to do in the, in the, in the warm weather. And so I began asking the Lord, what do you want me to share at this 20th anniversary for Steve? And slowly this text began to come alive in the form of blessing. It's Jesus' words to Peter when he says this. And Jesus answered him, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you lose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. So this blessing of Peter was tied to three things that kind of leaped out of me. First of all, revelation. He received some fresh revelation, and we'll talk about that in an instant. Secondly, as a result of that revelation, he's now going to be part of Christ's project, which is building his church. And thirdly, the authority that is necessary to resist the enemies of that project. Revelation, mission, and authority are the three things that make up this blessing. So I want to unpack each of those for you, and then I want to bless you, okay? So first of all, first with, with revelation. What's this revelation that Jesus is talking about? Well, the preceding dialogue before this, Jesus had asked his disciples, what are people saying about me? Well, some say you're this and some say you're that. And then he said, well, who do you say that I am? And Peter, the spokesman for the group, said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. He got it right. And Jesus said, no, you didn't get that from your own imagination, your own intellect. It required divine revelation. So the revelation that Jesus was talking about was revelation about the true nature of who Jesus is himself. You see, this is completely central to our lives, both as individuals and as the body of Christ. Everything flows from the worth and the value that we attach to the person of Jesus Christ. Not just up in here. We can believe things without valuing them. I mean, for years I believed in recycling, never bothered to recycle. Only when belief became a value did it become a, something that actually happened. The the treasure that Jesus is to us, his worth, his magnificence, that will affect everything else. As I unpack that for you, I want you to ask, think about worship for a minute. What do most Christians think of when we say, well, what's worship? Well, they almost always think about what happens on Sunday morning, which is a worship service. But even more to the point, they more often think of that in terms of the singing part of what happens. Which is why often on a Sunday morning on the way out, you might say, wait, how was the service? You will hear statements like, ah, well, the, the singing was great. Worship was great, but the preaching was lousy. Or oh, the preaching was great, but the worship was lousy. I don't like the worship style. What do they mean by that word worship? They're almost always talking about the songs. But worship is much broader than that. In fact, this is one of those rare situations where the secular use of the word worship is theologically more accurate than the way Christians use it. So out in the world, for example, you might hear someone say of another individual, let's imagine a sailor, you might say, hey, John really worships his boat. Now, what do, and what do you think they mean when they say that? They certainly don't mean that John kneels every morning before his boat and sings songs to the boat. They certainly don't believe that John has a little altar in his house with all kinds of photographs of his boat plastered in there uh, and encouraging everybody else to come and sing. No, that's not what they mean. What do they mean? They mean many things. They mean that John saved up a lot of money to buy this boat and that he's now saving up even more money to buy better accessories. That every spring John gets out there, washes that boat, gets it all out. He can hardly wait for the marinas to open to get into the water. And every fall when the time comes to put it back, he's just dying a thousand deaths to let that boat go. In the wintertime, he just subscribes to sailing magazines, which he reads them all the time. And he joins the sailing club and he hangs around with other sailors and they exchange stories about their boats and they bore everybody else with sailing stories. Right? That's what we mean. That man worships his boat. What, what happened to John is simply, he has come to the conclusion that the one thing that will satisfy the deepest longings of his heart and make life truly meaningful is boats and sailing. And therefore, John has reorganized life's priorities in terms of time, money, attention, community, and everything to get as much boat as he can. That's what, and that is a theologically, rigorously definition of worship. Because applied to God, it means that we have come to the conclusion 
that Jesus and Jesus alone will satisfy the deepest longings of our heart, the only one who can make life truly meaningful, and therefore we will radically adjust all of life's priorities to get as much of Jesus as we can. Can I say that again? Worship is to come to the conclusion that Jesus satisfies, and he alone, the deepest longings of our heart and gives meaning and purpose to our life, and therefore we radically reorient all of life's priorities to get as much of Jesus as we can. That's worship. That's why Bible study is worship. Because why do you study the Bible? Because it tells you about Jesus. That's why prayer is worship. Because when we pray to Jesus, we're saying, you alone can do this, God. We can't do it. Otherwise, you wouldn't be praying. You'd be going and doing it. That's why listening to a sermon carefully is worship, not because the preacher is brilliant, but because who he's talking about is worthy of attention. That's why when someone gets up and gives a testimony, you listen carefully because it's the testimony to the glory of Jesus. Everything we do becomes worship. That's why we raise children to the glory of God, because we want our sons and daughters who are going to exceed us in terms of their anointing. I pray regularly for my children. I have six grandchildren. One of my constant prayers for them is that they will be intensely anointed with the Spirit of God, because the world that they're facing is going to be ten times more hostile than mine. Why do I do that? Because Jesus is worthy, not because I want my children to have a great life. That's why all of life becomes worship. So here's my first blessing for you. I want to bless you with a continuing work of the Holy Spirit of God to magnify and glorify Jesus Christ and the worth and the value of Jesus both in your mind and in your heart. Now, how does this happen? The primary channel through which this happens is God's Word, not exclusively, but the primary channel through which the Spirit magnifies Jesus is through the Word. The living Word is magnified by the written Word for us. And but what kind of interaction are we talking about? We're not talking about a little promise box where we pull out our favorite promises for the day or the verse of the day that pops us on your computer, which nothing wrong with all of those things, or even the, the little verse for daily bread that we might read with a quick devotion. Again, none of those things are bad in themselves. But that's not what the scriptures are talking about if we're going to see the glory of Christ in and through them in such a way that we begin to treasure and value it. In fact, the, the metaphor that is used in the Bible is a surprising one. We're called to eat the book. By the way, children do it naturally. They literally eat books. That's why they, that's why they make them out of plastic. But somewhere along the line, we lost that ability. We start reading instead of eating. Three times in scriptures, the prophets of God are told to eat. Jer um, Ezekiel was told to eat the scroll and then go preach. John in the book of Revelation was told to eat, take the scroll from the hand of the angel and eat the word and then preach it. And Jeremiah, who happened to have a very tough task of preaching the gospel, to preaching the glory and the call of God to a group of people that were disobedient and heading into exile and he with them, said, when your words came, I ate them with delight. And then he preached as well. What does eating do? When we eat food, we don't just know about bread. We chew it. We masticate it. The saliva begins to break it down along with the digestive juices in our body, extracts the nutrients, and they get transformed into tissues and tissues into organs and organs into health and, and muscle and whatnot, and we get life. It becomes a part of us, so it's no longer separate from us. That's what, that's what our interactions with the Word of God are intended to be like. That, that, that kind of assimilation of that Word, the reading of it, the meditating of it, where it actually ends up becoming part of us and enlivens every part of us. That's why Hebrews calls it a living and an active Word for us. So I want to bless you. I want to bless you with an insatiable hunger for God's Word so that you will eat all of it and you will eat regularly and learn to relish it until increasingly with David you will say, the law of the Lord is perfect and restores the soul. The statutes of the Lord are trustworthy because they make me wise. The precepts of the Lord are right because they bring joy to my heart. The commandments of the Lord are radiant and enlighten my eyes. And the fear of the Lord, which is a synonym for God's law, is pure and endures forever. And the ordinances of the Lord are sweeter than honey in the honeycomb. Now, this blessing is also to counter a very significant danger. 
God's work, word is under attack in the evangelical church, even in some of our alliance churches. It's like the Trojan horse that sneaks in, looks harmless on the outside, but laden with explosive danger on the inside. It kind of takes this form, the new paradigm, is that if I encounter something in the Bible that I don't understand about God or don't like it, then I'm going to just simply redefine that God so that he is acceptable to me. This is making God in our image, not us being made in God's image. Well-known Christian leaders are saying things like the Old Testament is now irrelevant to us. Now, this is not to deny that there are significant parts of the scriptures that make us stop and say, oh, really? I mean, every year as I read through the Bible, I'm going to sections primarily in Old Testament ethics. Say, really, God? But it's how you deal with those things. When you're up against a God you don't understand, and the people of God felt that all the time. They dealt with it not by redefining God, but by grappling with this God. He's big enough to handle any questions that you can give him anyway. The very first prayer in the Bible is that of Abraham. He was up against a God he couldn't understand because God did, uh, said, I'm going to destroy Sarah. And God said, how can you do that? Abraham said, you can't do that. You can't destroy the righteous or the wicked. You can't do that, God. Far be it from you, O oh God, to do that. So he was engaging God. And then David in Psalm 70, or Asaph in Psalm 73 he, he was dealing with a very frank situation that many of us experienced. Life and theology were battling, and life was beating up on theology. Because he began by saying, the, theologically, he says, surely God is good to Israel, and God is good to those who are pure in heart. Yeah, that sounds good, right? But as for me, if you want to look at my situation, he said, my foot had almost slipped when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. You're blessing the wicked God, not the righteous. Your theology says you should be blessing the righteous, but the wicked that seems to be prospering, I'm in real trouble. And he says, if I try to figure out all this, it was becoming oppressive to me until, until I entered the sanctuary of God, until he began to worship this God that he couldn't understand. And lo and behold, guess who changed? God didn't change. He changed. And he ends the psalm by saying, as for me, it is good to be near God. Yeah, there was no problem with the goodness of God. He just didn't understand what true goodness was all about. True goodness wasn't the comfortable life that the wicked were experiencing. True goodness was proximity to God. In them. So that's how you engage with this God. So as you're reading the scriptures, I want to bless you again. I want to bless you with a tenacious spirit that is willing to wrestle with God about things about God that you do not understand until the God who refuses to be redefined redefines you and changes you. Now, back to our text again. Look how he opens it. He says, Blessed are you, Simon. He calls him Simon. Bar Jonah means son of Jonah. Blessed are you, Simon. And then he says, Uh, this where does he go? And you will become Peter. For flesh and blood is not revealed to you of my father who is in heaven. I tell you, you are Peter. There was a name change that happened as a result of this revelation. Way back in John's gospel, when Andrew and Peter, Andrew first found Jesus and brought Peter to him, Jesus said to him, You are Simon, but you will be called Peter. Now the time had come. Simon had become Peter. And he says, on this rock I will build my church. See, now, name changes. For us, they are cute things. We name our children all kinds of names for all kinds of reasons. We just like to, a name that sounds like another well-known name, but we change a letter to spell it differently. We do things like that. In the Bible, name changes were associated with destinies and hope. Peter said, you're the rock. I'm going to build this church, not on Peter, as some... Elements within Christianity believe, but on this confession that you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. So what that was saying to Peter was this revelation that you've had as to who I really am is not just for private enjoyment of me. It is that you will get become part of this mission that I'm doing, which is building the church. I will build the church. And so too for us. The second dimension of the blessing I want to give you is the purpose of that revelation. 
The revelation of who Jesus is for us is not for our private enjoyment. And just like we needed to rethink worship, we need to rethink conversion. Many people think about conversion in terms of a decision that we made. Well, I put, put my hand up at a Billy Graham crusade. Or I went forward to church one day. Or as it's happened more often in many of our churches, I attended an Alpha session. And there on the Alpha weekend, Holy Spirit weekend, I gave my life to Christ. And it is true. It does involve a decision. The scripture does cast that as, as a decision. Choose ye this day whom you will choose. Choose that, choose that. But behind our choosing something more dramatic is happening. Because when the Apostle Paul just talked about his conversion, in Philippians chapter 3, he says this. He said, my brothers, I have not yet arrived. This was after being a, one of the most spectacular missionaries for 20 years. He said, I have not yet arrived. And he says this, I have not yet taken a hold of that for which Jesus Christ took a hold of me. How does he see his conversion? Paul does not talk about his conversion as some decision he made to follow Jesus. He talks about his conversion as Jesus getting a hold of him and saying, here, you belong to me now. Now you say, isn't that just semantic? This is really make it makes a huge difference. I'll tell you why. Because so long as we think of our conversion as simply our decision to follow Jesus, he will remain one among many other choices we make. Our careers, our hobbies, our spouses, and whatever else. And so he will get his little part one and a half hours on Sunday, and somebody else will get this much time, and my hobby will get this much time. And life becomes compartmentalized and fragmented. That's why we are so dissatisfied deep down within. And we have to ask ourselves in an honest moment, is this all there is to being a Christian? But it's because it's fragmented. But if you say, no, my becoming a Christian was Jesus getting a hold of me for his purposes, then all these other choices about my career, my projects, my spouses, everything gets subsumed under the purpose for which Jesus got a hold of me. That's a radical reorientation. You see, we, and that is and Christ's mission under which all these things get subsumed is to build his church globally. You see, you cannot love Jesus without loving his church. It would be tantamount to coming to some associate of yours and say, hey, I really like you. I just can't stand your wife. <laughs> it's not going to get you very far. At least you shouldn't. But this is exactly what people are saying. who say, well, I, say, I like Jesus. I just don't stand the church. It's not an option. As the Holy Spirit continues to magnify Jesus' glory and Jesus' worth, he says, but there's a bride I'm building. I'm beautifying that bride. There's a wedding day that's coming. So you can love the church. Now, what is that? It's not a consumer kind of a love. Many people, when they say, if I say, do you love your church? Yeah, we do. What, they, what many normally mean is, yeah, well, I love the pastor. We love the sermons. We love the programs for our children. We're very happy here. That's not what he's talking about. Consumers are happy with that kind of approach. No, no, no. He's talking about the kind of spirit that Psalm 137, you read it sometimes. It's actually a psalm written for when Israel was in exile, when their tormentors, their captors were saying, entertain us with one of your songs. The Hebrews were a singing people, unique in ancient Near Eastern culture. But they said, oh, we, got, oh, we, we got our harps hung up. We're not sing the songs of, song, songs of God in a foreign land. And then they say this. If I forget you, O Jerusalem, let my right hand forget its skill. Can't play the harp anymore. Let my tongue stick to the roof of my mouth. If I do not remember you, if I do not set Jerusalem above my highest joy. Above every personal, private joy and agenda is the people of God. Jerusalem, then the church today. It's again, it's just a radical reorienting of priorities that makes the church primary and us part of that. We're a highly individualistic society. We've turned everything else around. We get our primary identity from our, as individuals. And secondarily, we pick and choose community. Or is it intended to be the other way around? Jesus came to form a whole new community. Are we, you're supposed to get our identity. You're first and foremost the people of God before you are Sundar Krishna or whoever. Now, that starts with building the church here, gateways the next 25 years or 30 years or however long God gives you here. 
but it's also global. You're part of a denomination where the church is being built globally. And that is still an unfinished task with millions of people to yet hear the gospel and have a worshipping community established in there. This is why, by the way, missions is not fundamentally about getting converts. It's about building worshipping communities. Remember when Paul writes to Titus, he says, finish the work that I started by appointing elders in every local church. Until that is done, the work isn't finished. Now, participation is global church building, as in the local church building and the national church building, involves people. And right now, even though the rest, the remaining task is very difficult, all of the remaining unfinished, the unfinished work is among the most resistant people in the world to the gospel, in the harshest climates, in the most difficult geographical terrain, and with the languages that are hardest to learn. So it's going to take a very special breed of people. But you know what? God is raising them up. Dave Hearn told me there's over 50 people that are ready to go right within our alliance now. And they need money. And so building the church is going to require finances. People finance it, but more than anything else, it's going to require prayer for the Great Commission. If you read through the Bible, and do that as an exercise sometime, especially with Paul's prayer request, you will find that he has tied the success of every dimension of the Great Commission to the prayers of God's people. Prayer for laborers. Or Jesus said that, pray that the Lord of the harvest and not laborers. In Romans chapter 15, Paul says, pray for me that my service may be acceptable to the saints. Unity, unity between Christians, which is a huge, huge issue on the mission field, and locally as well, is tied to the prayers of God's people. It, to, to, to Ephesians, he says, pray for me that I may preach the word of God boldly and without a fearfully. And to Colossians, he says, pray for open doors that I may unlock the mystery of the gospel. The gospel that seems so simple to you and me is not at all simple to people who are lost. My mother heard the gospel from me for 51 years before she died at the age of 92 without receiving Christ. And all she could say is, I don't understand, I don't understand, I don't understand. The simple gospel is anything but simple to the lost. It needs that revelation. And so we need prayer for that. Paul writes in Corinthians, he said, the sentence of death was upon us. We despaired of life itself. We were under hard pressure. Depression, despair, and death, which are 3D hallmarks of most of work in these difficult places. But Paul says, God will deliver us as you cooperate together in your prayers. It just goes on and on. Pray for the rapid spreading of the word, he says to the Thessalonians. To the, when he's in jail, he says to the Philippians, pray for me because in answer to your prayers, I know I'm going to come out. Every dimension of the success of the Great Commission is linked to the prayers of God's people. No wonder Jesus, when he came, remember when he cleansed the temple, he was furious about that temple. Why was he so furious? It wasn't just about the money changing and the trafficking that was going on, although that was true too. It was where it was taking place. It was taking place in the outer court of the Gentiles and the way the temple in Judaism was set up, if there was a God-fearing Gentile who wanted to worship the God of Israel, Yahweh, he could come to the outer court. That's all. He couldn't go past that. And yet that one place had become a den of thieves. That's why he said, my father's house shall be called a house of prayer for the nations, but you have made it into a den of thieves. And Jesus was furious, and he cleansed the temple. What would he say if he came to examine Gateway? Is this a house of prayer for the nations of the world? Both for the nations to come in, and for the nations. So I want to bless you again. I want to bless you with a reconversion experience that you might be born again, again, so that like the Apostle Paul, you will change your whole view of conversion and say, I have not yet taken a hold of that for which Christ has taken hold of me. I am no longer a consumer, but I'm a builder of the church here and to the uttermost corners of the earth. And you know why this is a blessing? Because my faith grows tremendously through my involvement with many, many international workers from our church and others because it's where God seems to do the kind of amazing miracles that don't happen very often here. I mean, it's happening more and more, praise God. And I hear about wonderful things that are happening right here under Pastor Steve's leadership. 
may God multiply your brother in that direction. But by and large, if, if I had time, that would be in the whole sermon and stuff to tell you the kind of stories that you don't even hear about in the Bible that are happening. I just came back from two weeks uh, preaching to an organization that has 3,000 international workers. And some of the stories that they tell me is just amazing. And when I hear them, read about them, I say, oh yeah, he really is, he has it. I believe, I believe. We just sang earlier on in the morning. Say, ah, do you really believe? I do when I hear stories like that. There is no other name under heaven whereby people can be saved. And then when I read their prayer letters and pray through them, they have insight and understanding into scripture that I don't find in any classic scholarly commentary sometimes. That's not to knock the scholarly commentaries, I use them. But I remember not too long ago, one particular work, a friend of ours who works amongst the kids that are rescued from the sex slave trade in Cambodia. She was talking about difficulties, which happen all the time in these places, and she's a woman of prayer and the word of God, and she had an essay on faith, hope, and love. I have never read anything like that in any commentary on Corinthians. This is why I stay involved. This is why this blessing is actually a blessing for you. It will increase your faith here to do that work. Very quickly. And lastly. This task that Jesus is building, the church, is an opposed task. He said the gates of hell. The word gates are strategies. The strategies of the enemy. We have an enemy 24-7, he doesn't take any holidays, any vacations. He hates the church because Jesus loves the church. Satan hates what Jesus loves. Jesus loves the church. Satan can't get at Jesus. And so he goes after the church 24-7. Now Jesus' words to Peter declare that Satan's strategies will not succeed. And that he has been given the keys of the kingdom. So that's the third word I want to bless you with. Not just revelation, not just mission, but authority as well. Your part in this mission, building the church and gateway in this country and to the uttermost corners of the earth, is an opposed task. And you need to know your, you need to know your strategies of the enemy. They're not going to overcome you. That's what Jesus said. But you need to know what they are. Otherwise, you'll be blindsided. And you know what his fundamental strategy is? It's not bringing about sickness and disease. There was a time in our church where five or six different people simultaneously were struggling with terminal cancer. And there were people in the congregation that were concerned that we were under satanic attack and things like that. No, not really. Not really. God and Satan are both involved in the issue of suffering. It has to do with how you respond to them. But you know what his favorite weapon is? Division. That's what it was from the very beginning. Way back in Genesis chapter 3. Division through deception, right? He deceived Adam and Eve, and immediately there was fracture in the relationship. Relational chaos is his specialty. So you need to watch out for that. You don't have to be afraid of it, because he will not succeed. But if you're not aware of it, and you're not alert to it, you're going to become sitting ducks for that. That's why Jesus in John chapter 17, in his very last prayer, what did he pray for? You really want to know what's important to Jesus? Listen to his prayer just before he went to the cross. He prays for unity. Father, may they be one. Protect them by the power of your name from the evil one as I protected them. May they be one as you and I are one. The very unity and the community that is in the Trinity. And we sang that. I believe in the Trinity. We sang that three times. What is the implications of the Trinity? Community is a critical implication of the Trinity. Jesus said, may they be one, so that the world will know that you sent me and that you love me. That's why Paul in Ephesians chapter 4, when in Ephesians 6 is when he talks about the devil and the weapons of our warfare, but you need to know what he sets before that. In the first three chapters of Ephesus, Ephesians, he just talks about the church the way God sees the church, because visibly the church wasn't anything. They had four massive powers against them. The intellectual might of Greece, the military might of Rome, the Religious zeal of Judaism. And Ephesus was also the seat of the worship of Diana, the goddess of the underworld, with real demonic powers. Four massive oppositions to the church. Visible church, small, tiny, distributed, divided. Paul wasn't scared. He said, let me tell you how God sees the church. Chosen in eternity past. 
a, a demonstration of the incomparable greatness of Christ's power. That's who you are. A demonstration of the incomparable riches of Christ's grace. That's who you are. And an incom a demonstration of the manifold wisdom of God. That's who the church is. And then he says, therefore, in the light of this, how should you live? Put on your weapons and fight? No, no, that's coming in chapter 6. Because in chapter 4, he says, guard the unity of the Spirit through humility, meekness, and patience. Because he understands that that's where the enemy will attack you. And so here's my final blessing for you. I want to bless you with an unshakable conviction that the cause that you're on the building of the church is guaranteed to succeed. I want to bless you with alertness to the strategies of the enemy. And I want to bless you with a passion for unity and a desire to guard it through humility, meekness, and patience. So Gateway, will you stand up now and receive these blessings from me afresh? Stretch forth your hand. Close your eyes if that helps you. Open your eyes and look at me if that helps you. It doesn't matter. I want to gather up these blessings and please remember again, I'm only putting the name of Jesus on you. His promise, this covenant keeping Yahweh's promises, I will bless you. All right? This, this is no exercise in power of positive thinking, folks. This is the supernatural work of the Holy Spirit releasing the incredible potential that is built up in this church because of the faithfulness of Steve and Krista and your faithfulness to them for these 20 years, you're just wait, waiting with anticipation, all right? That's the word that's been filling my mind after the first service. Holy anticipation of what is yet to come. And so, I want to bless you with the continuing work of the Holy Spirit who will keep on magnifying and exalting Jesus in your minds and heart through an insatiable hunger for his word. I want to bless you with a tenacious spirit that will wrestle with God about the things of God that you cannot understand until the God who refuses to be redefined redefines you and renames you. I have blessed you with a reconversion experience. May you be born again, again, so that you will say, I am no longer a consumer, but a builder. And I want to bless you with the unshakable conviction that the mission that you're on is guaranteed to succeed, that you have a defeated enemy you have authority over him. You are not unaware of his devices and that you will pursue unity through humility, meekness, and patience. In Jesus' name, you are a blessed.